this morning I'm excited about this series. Before I get started, though, I gotta clarify a couple things. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, things that we did last night. Um, well, the thing we did last night was. Did y'all enjoy the dream team party? Come on, man. If you see pur- if you see purple shirts, it's because they went to the dream team party last night. Look, I'm telling y'all, if you didn't come, you missed a hoot, son. It was, oh, dude, the back pew boys. <laughs> Golly. <laughs> The Spice Squirrels. That, that, that group was a little disturbing. The most disturbing group was Redneck Hospitality by far. Man. Golly. Scott Bailey came in this morning. He said, I'll never look at some of these people the same again. I said, I said, me neither, man. I was disturbed by some of the things that I saw last night. So it was uh, a... <laughs> It was a lot of fun, man. Good food, a lot of, lot of great fun. So uh, if you don't get on a dream team for any other reason, come for the dream team party. I'll be honest with you. Like, it's, it is worth being on a dream team just to come to the party. Uh, we had such a good time. We do it once a year, and so we love celebrating you guys. Can't thank you enough uh, with, with all the dream teamers that we have and 20-plus teams that we have for you to sign up for. Growth track step one is today. So if you would like to do that, it's in the next service. During the service in the um, growth track room behind us. By the way, let's welcome in the hub. The hub is next door, giving us a little bit of space. So, as you can see, we're kind of full in here, and so they give us a little more space next door. There's up to 50 seats in there, so they're next door worshiping with us. So we're so thankful for that. Uh, can we give it up for our first time guests in the house? Come on, first time guests. Yeah, thank you guys for coming. We're so glad that you're here. But one one quick thing I got to get out of the way before getting to my message. Uh, she's not here yet. She'll be here next service, but. Uh, 2018, we did a lip sync battle, or 17, somewhere in that. It was pre-COVID, okay? Everything is pre or post-COVID, right? So sometime pre-COVID, we did a lip sync battle, and, uh, and we fell short on one, to me, one trophy that should have been presented, and it was to the bearded lady, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Tasha Chafin, if you're watching this online right now, I know you're coming next service. I got something for you. 2000. 2018 Dream Team. So this is yours. I've been holding it till now for four years. I've been holding it. So that's going to be presented to you because the bearded lady, she was sitting in the audience and got up and started belting out her part. Like, I don't know how she lip synced it. I thought she was really singing it. It was incredible. Uh, the team also, it was just awesome. So so that's for you. We'll give it to you when you get here next service. And uh, But anyway, we had a good time, y'all. We just, we loved it. I don't think the church laughs enough. Um, I really don't. I don't think we have enough fun. I think you can, obviously that's a ditch you can get into and not get serious. But I think the church in general is too serious. And, and I, think, I think Jesus was a funny dude. I mean, I think, he, I think sometimes he says some stuff. And if you read it, you're just like, he was really gigging somebody right there. He, was a, he might have had a hair of sarcasm, but, but it wasn't sin, obviously. But, uh, so I don't know if sarcasm is a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> but, um, but Jesus said some stuff. Like, he went after the Pharisees, and it was not pretty. Like, he was, I'm sure the, I'm sure the, the disciples, like, burn. Like, like, it was like... You know, scrape the, you know, like scraping the toast all. He was burning some people. He was just lighting them up. But, but I think we don't, we don't have enough, enough fun, I don't think, in the church. And, uh, but, but, but church is to be, um, it's, we have a serious job, let me say that. And if you don't have a little laughter, uh, it can get heavy. Uh, because our job, the job of the church is to reach the lost. That, that is why the church exists. That's why this church exists. We're going to celebrate people moving from death to life between services about 1040, 1045 in the breeze. We're going to have four baptisms this morning. Come on, that's so exciting. And, uh, but, but that's why we exist, because if we're not stirring the baptism waters, uh, we, can just, we just need to shut it down and go do something different, because that's why we do what we do, is to see people's lives change. And so um, one of the things that we use here as a tool to help people find Jesus is a little powerful book called, we call it the Little Yellow Book, Praying Effective for the Lost. I'm teaching through this series right now. We're going to go chapter by chapter, so we're going to be in chapter two. Uh, I could almost do a series on each chapter, and the chapters are short, okay? It's like 55 pages total, uh, so there's five chapters. So you're talking about some chapters are a couple of pages, but you could almost do a whole series on each chapter because there's so much good stuff. We have a free copy for every single person in the breezeway at Next Steps, and so grab you one. Uh, we should have plenty, so if we do, so for some reason, run out, we got more. We got plenty more to get you, so get one of those copies. Don't miss it. It's, it's just so, so powerful. We, I can just stand up here. <coughs> <for the coughs> excuse me. 
for the rest of my time this morning and just tell you story after story after story after story of people who prayed the principles and found that uh, they worked. I had a guy call me from Florida when I was working for Dad's ministry. In fact, our church was actually founded, and that's the foundation of our ministry of this church is, is PEO Ministries, Praying in Effect for the Lost Ministries. And he called me, and he was telling me about how his he had been praying for his son for, for I think, 17 years. Uh, the son was now 34 years old. At 17, he became addicted to drugs, and for 17 years, he was addicted. And so they began to tell us what happened. He said, I was actually the, the deacon of my church, and, or one of the deacons of my church, and I felt shame because everybody knew that my son uh, was an addict. And so he said, I just, I just didn't pray with the right motives because I knew everybody knew. And so I wanted him to get saved so that people would stop talking about my son being in and out of jail and you know, addicted. And so he said, I changed my motive. And when I changed my motive, which you read in the book about changing your motive, our motive for praying for lost people should always be for God to get the glory. Not because you need a better husband, as some of y'all do, all right? Not because you need a better wife. Not because you want your kids to, because some of y'all trying to open up a can of act right on your kids, right? You just, you know, if they just get saved, they'd act better. Well, that, it's a side effect, but that can't be why you're praying for them. They have an eternal soul. They're going to spend eternity somewhere. And if they don't know Jesus, it's going to be in hell. So your reason for praying for lost people has got, your motive has got to be for God to get the glory. This guy said, I changed my motive. I began to pray for God to get the glory, not that he would be a better person or not be the black sheep or people stop talking, but for God to get the glory. And almost immediately he got saved. Just motive. It was just a, a motive shift. So, so that's just a little nugget that's in this book. You got to get the book. We're giving them away. If you're going to please, if you're going to take take it, at least read it. Um, uh, it's it's a powerful book. But today we're on chapter two, and chapter two is the biblical basis. I'm going to give you some biblical bases, the biblical reasons, six of them, why we need to pray for lost people. And this comes right out of the book. And uh, it, it's just it's just too good not to give them to you straight. So I'm going to give them to you. Here's the first one that we got to get. The first one is this. Uh, and that is our love for the lost. The biblical basis is we should love people. Like, like that has to be, agape love has got to be the reason that we pray for people. And if it isn't, you won't keep praying. If you don't pray, pray for them because you love them, you will, you will quit praying. Also, what I have found is when you start praying for them, you, are, you find out that you love them a little more. And then you love them a little more. And so, so it's a powerful thing. So our love for the lost. In fact, Paul was powerful. Paul wrote this statement right here. Here's what Paul said. He said, I will gladly spend myself and all I have for you, even though it seems that the more I love you, the less you love me. He says, I'm pouring out on you. And let me just tell you, this is the picture of ministry right here. The more I love you, the less you love me. The more I help you, the less you care. The more I help you, the more you talk about me. That's ministry. Thank goodness I was raised in ministry, so I have a little bit of thick skin, and I'm trying to get tougher without getting meaner. That's our goal. That's what we talk about leadership meetings. Like We need to be tougher without being meaner. That's hard to do, but we got to do it because this is ministry. He says, I want to be spent for you. This is Paul. He says, and look, he says, I will gladly not mope about it, not tell the whole world about it, not get on social media and say, I prayed for this person. I helped them out. They didn't do nothing for me. No. Somebody's calling you out because you didn't do enough for them, don't respond. Because responding to error only creates more error. I learned that the hard way. Don't think I hadn't typed something out. Delete, 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 delete. Anybody been there? Typed it out again. Sometimes just typing it out feels good, right? Delete it. Don't send it. All right? Don't hit send. But he says, I will gladly spend to be spent for you. I I'm going to gladly do it. There's a story of a parable that God, that Jesus tells and, uh, and he tells a pair about a, a rich man and a poor man. He said the poor man, Lazarus, didn't have anything, and he died and went to heaven. And the rich man, who had everything, died and went to hell because he didn't know Jesus. And the poor man knew Jesus. And so this, the, and then the, we, we kind of get a picture of what it looks like in the parable of what it looks like uh, when you end up in hell. Here, here's what he says. He says the rich man, this is from heaven, I mean from hell. The rich man said, please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. So he says, send somebody. I got, I got some people I need a witness to. Go send somebody. Now, he's already passed on. He's doing this from hell. Look at what he says. Look, look, look at the next verse. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. He was giving us a picture of what it looks like when people pass on. Their focus is their family. Now, he was too busy making money to focus on his family while he was on earth. Anybody been there? I have. I did a lot of traveling when I was younger, and, and I realized one day I was losing my, I mean, I wasn't, 
I mean, we were still getting along. We were great roommates, but I was not around with my family. My, my wife was uh, training our kids up. She was disciplined. She was doing everything because I was gone. And I had to wake up one day and say, it's not worth it. Now, is there a season you need to do it to go get some stuff straight? Yes, there's a season. But understand seasons. and Because I know people who were doing it when I was doing it back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I saw one the other day at the gas station. They're still doing it. So there's seasons. You've got to do it. But, but here's the thing. He realized too late that money mattered less than eternal souls. So we got to have love for people. Here's the second thing. that Here's the second biblical reason why we need to pray for lost people. And that is our faith in God. <clears throat> the biblical basis for praying for lost people should be our faith in God. We've we got to have faith that God is going to step in and do something. Now, um, there's a, I'm putting this, this one right behind the first one. First of all, it's in the book that way. But here's why it's in the book. Because there's a scripture that ties faith and love together. Because uh, faith and love actually work together in tandem. In fact, I love this, this version of the scripture, Genesis, uh, Galatians 5, 6. This is the amplified version. It says, for we are, if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision or uncircumcision counts for anything. In other words, physical stuff don't matter. Religion is what he's saying here. He's really talking about religious people. Religion doesn't matter, which that goes for today as well. He says, but only uncircumcision, circumcision doesn't matter. In other words, what you do physically doesn't matter. But only faith, watch this, activated, energized, and expressed, and working through agape. See, see, your love that's been, I mean, your faith has been activated, energized, expressed, and working through love. Here's what it's saying. You can say that you have faith, but if you ain't love enough people to go, love, loving people enough to go show it somewhere, you don't really have faith. You can't have faith without love. It's impossible. And that's why it says faith, hope, and love. The Bible says that faith is a substance of things hoped for. So hope is the bucket. Faith is what fills it. But listen, none of that even happens until love energizes your faith. We have to have faith in Jesus. In fact, uh, there were some people who came to Jesus on several occasions, and they wanted him to help them out. And there was a guy who was struggling with this kid who had some issues, and here's what he came to Jesus and said. The spirit often throws him into the fire or into the water trying to kill him. Have mercy on us and help us. If you can. Um, we just sang a song that says he can. Huh? We just sang a song that says, yes, he can. And, and here's what Jesus' response. I love Jesus' response because it's what he's asking for is faith here. This is what Jesus says. He says, what do you mean if I can? I told you, Jesus was kind of funny. I, I love what you what you talking about willis what what you mean if i can anything is possible if a person believes faith you know what anything means in the original language it means every stuff <laughs> it means it means anything whatever you're going through now we need to ask in god's will i'm not telling you to go pray for a million dollars and it's going to happen i'm saying if it's in his will and let me just tell you, telling you what, I'm telling you, praying for lost people is in his will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It's in his will. You can know when you pray for a lost person that it's in his will. I did it on purpose. You, I'm just telling when you pray, you can, because some, some things you're praying for, you're just like, God, I don't know, this new job, I don't know what I should do. If I should take the job, say where I'm at, take this other job. I just don't know what your will is. When you pray for this, it is in his will. There is no question marks. It's in this way, but you've got to have faith to believe that God's going to do it. Here's number three. Uh, this one's very, very Im important, and that is the power of prayer. The power of prayer. Uh, there's an interesting story back in 2 Kings, <clears throat> and uh, it's in 19, but you can kind of, kind of go back and read. I think 18, it kind of starts the story. But in 19, it starts telling a story about Hezekiah, who's the king of Israel. And so Hezekiah is facing the Assyrian army, and the Assyrian army is just starting to belittle them and and they're starting to really run their mouth about some things. And, and so anyway, they end up sending a letter to Hezekiah to tell him, hey, look, look, I mean, it's pretty much over with. We done wiped everybody out, and you're next. I know you've heard about us, and so we're coming, all right? We're on the way. Get your stuff ready. We're on our way. So here's what Hezekiah did. Um, Hezekiah had the right attitude because Hezekiah was, by, he was, he was, he was behind the ropes, man. He was on the ropes. I mean, he was down for the count. He was like, if it was a wrestling match, he was on the count, and the referee done hit the mat twice. It was almost over. I mean, this Assyrian armor was just about to come demolish him. And so here, here's what happened. Watch what Hezekiah does. So, so he sends him a letter, 
Uh, and so in the letter, he tells him, he says, look, we'll send you horses if you could just send some people and come out. Just, if you can even find people to get on the horses and come ride them, I'm going to send you some free horses. I'll take some free horses. So I just, just, I'll send some horses over, put some soldiers on it, and come out and fight. I mean, he was really taunting him. So here's what Hezekiah did. Listen, this is not always our response. It should be. Here's, it's not always our response. But watch what he does. After Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it, he went up to the Lord's temple and spread it out before the Lord. He actually took the letter and opened it up and laid it out before the Lord. Now, I don't know if it needed to be open for the Lord to read it. I doubt it. Depending on how small the print is, I don't know how Lord, close the Lord had to get, but I've been finding out real recently that my eyes are 44 years old. Be 45 in May. We went to Sonic the other night. Amy wanted, we wanted to get some uh, mozzarella sticks. She's like, how many count does it come in? I don't know. I couldn't read it. I was, I got out of, I got, look, stuck my head through the window and look. <laughs> Y'all, it was, it's a very hard wake up call. When you can't order from the fast food place because your eyes are going, it's not okay, all right? So I'm sure he opened the letter up and just, he didn't have to, y'all. God knew what it said. God knew what it said. He opened the letter and this is what, this is what he did. He said, and Hezekiah prayed this prayer before the Lord. Now, I want you to see his prayer because his, his prayer shows some desperation. And in our bumper, it says God doesn't just hear prayer. He hears desperate prayer. How long has it been since you've been desperate? Has it been a while? Have you shed more tears for the basketball series going on than you have for the lost souls that are dying and going to hell? Here's a prayer that he prayed. Watch what he prays. I love this. He says, now, O Lord, our God, rescue us from his power. And here's why, watch this. Then all the kings of the earth will know that you alone are Lord, O oh God. So he's, he's very clear, rescue us. And let me just tell you, you don't have to have some long, elaborate prayer. If you're struggling right now, having issues and problems and situations in your family, at your job, you don't have to get before the Lord and spend 17 hours fasting and praying. Now, if you want to, that's amazing. But you can just say two words, Lord, rescue me. I'm struggling. I got the shovel out, nothing's happening. I can't find the rock to build on. He simply said, rescue us. And watch what the Lord does. I mean, just if you think you know how God's going to answer a prayer, he always does it a different way. That's what I found. When I, when I have financial issues and problems and struggles, I didn't think that God was going to answer it this way, and he did. When I have relationship situations, I didn't know he was going to answer it the way that he did. I, God, I have seen God put, put relationships together that you thought would never come back together. And it happened in a way I never thought was possible. But here's what he did. Here's what, you got. Well, here's what he does. I love the answer to this. This, this is a powerful, powerful passage. The Bible says, that night, the angel of the Lord went out to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. And I love, they, went, they added this. I love this phrase. And when the surviving Assyrians woke up the next morning, they found corpses everywhere. Just in case you needed a visual picture, there were, there were corpses everywhere. But here's what I love. Here's what I want you to see. Uh, that is a singular angel. Y'all, he sent an angel. In fact, the Bible tells us that when, that when Satan's time is coming to an end, and let me just tell you, it's almost here. When his time comes to the end, he's going to be thrown into the pit, and it's going to be closed and sealed, and it says an angel is going to do it. And ain't one angel. He sent one angel in one night and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Prayer is powerful. It's powerful. Why don't we do it more? Focus is one. Y'all, I just deleted my social media apps two weeks ago. I ain't never been more free. I was on it all the time. And I'm just going to be real with you. There were times I opened my phone up for days after that. Even as recent as just a couple of days, I opened it up, flipped to the page where it normally is, and clicked on it. It wasn't there. Because I have trained myself that any moment I have that's not filled with something else, I'm going to fill it with something stupid. And social media can get stupid. Or YouTube, name it. We fill all our void times with something else. 
Prayer is powerful. Why don't we pray more? We're not focused on it. It's powerful. Here's the fourth thing i got to give you, and that is simply God's expectation of the church. God expects the church to pray. We have a prayer group that meets up here at 8.30 on Sunday mornings. Everybody's welcome in the hub. Awesome time of prayer. We do it every single Sunday. We pray for the services. We pray for you guys. We pray uh, for everybody that's coming, for the team members. Uh, and then Monday nights at 6 in the hub, we also meet for prayer. It's a prayer small group. It's open to anybody. If you want to come tomorrow night, we have prayer cards out. And I don't, I thought I had one with me, but I don't. Um, we have prayer cards up here on the speakers. Grab one, fill it out. We want to pray for you and your situation. Here's what I would challenge you. If you're going to fill it out and drop it in the offering box, come help us. Come help us pray. We got Our stack's getting thick. And we need some help. Now, we pray over every single card. If you put a card in that box and we have it, we should still have it. We pray over it every single week. We never miss a time where we don't pray over the, every single card that comes through. In fact, God expects the church to pray so much that he actually uh, expects us. And, and, and I'm going to show you a story in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 59. It says that this, and this, I had to throw this verse in here, verse 14, because this is so today, it's not even funny. Our courts oppose the righteous. Hello? This is 2022. I know this was written back then, but it was for today. Justice is nowhere to be found. Truth stumbles in the streets. Listen, a lie will get up and travel around the world before truth gets its boot on in the morning. Am I not? I'm telling you. A lie will travel around the world before truth even gets its boots on in the morning. Truth is stumbling in the streets. Nobody wants to hear truth right now. You know what this is? This is truth. And, and I'm going to tell you why nobody wants to hear it. Because when you read it, you need to get convicted. When you read it, you get convicted and you need to change. And nobody wants to change. We love sin too much. We, we just excuse what we do away. He says, truth is, I, I just, when I saw this, and it was in the verses before I had to show you, truth is stumbles in the streets, and honesty has been outlawed. Yeah, I mean, this is today. And then look at the next verse. It says, yes, yes, truth is gone, and anyone who renounces evil is attacked. Hello? The Lord looked and is displeased to find that there was no justice. And watch what he says about the, about the church, about the group of people who are supposed to be doing something. He was amazed to see that nobody intervened. And that word, uh, the original word there is inter they, never, they weren't interceding. They weren't praying. Um, have you ever, did you know God was amazed? I always say God was never, he's never amazed about our situations. He was amazed right here that the church was not interceding for lost people. That nobody was actually going between uh, hell and heaven and crying out for somebody. So he himself stepped in to save them with his, with his strong arm and his justice sustained them. And he's predicting Jesus right here is what he's doing. He's saying Jesus, nobody else was doing it. Nobody was stepping up and doing the right thing. So he sent Jesus to die for you and for me. He was amazed. I'm going to tell you, you don't want to amaze God because if you are, it's probably because you're not praying. First Timothy gives us an idea of what it should look like when we pray. He says, I urge you, first of all, the first thing you should do, is to pray for everybody, all people. And then he gives us why. He says, ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Uh, I'm just going to tell you right now, if you would just start thanking, some thanking God for some people in your life, it will change the way you look at them. Some of y'all are thankful when they leave your house, all right? <laughs> so we talk about those people that light up the room when they leave it. So, so you know who I'm talking about. If, if you don't know who I'm talking about, it's you. All right. <laughs> but he says, he says, ask God to help them, intercede on their behalf, and give thanks for them. And look at verse 4. A few verses later, here's what he says. He, who, talking about God, God who wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth. He says, first of all, before you do anything else, prayer, pray, pray, pray. And don't just pray for anything. Pray for everyone to be saved. Um, I, I shared this with you last week. There's a couple of groups of people who get in some ditches. You have Calvinists and Arminiists, and I think they're both wrong to some degree. I think Jesus is in the middle. Um, the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. Jesus is saying the church has a responsibility. He expects us to pray. 
He wants every single person to come to know Jesus, even the person that you hate the most right now where you're sitting. Because you know what Jesus said? Jesus changed. He flipped the script. He came and he said, pray for your enemies. He doesn't pray for him. What? Um, that would be like Ukraine praying for God to bless Putin right now. That's what he tells us to do. He's flipped the whole script, so we have to pray because, listen, it is expected of the church. Here is number five, biblical examples. There are some biblical examples that show us that we should be praying for lost people. Uh, And not just for the lost, but also for healing and other things. But today we're going to talk specifically about lost people. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 1 says, Dear brothers and sisters, the longing of my heart and my prayer to God is for people of Israel to be saved. He said, the longing of my heart is to see Israel and and the the chosen people, and you could put that on us today, for them to be saved. Uh, Here's another verse. I shared this with you last week, but i got to show it to you again. It's so powerful. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. So he saves those that come to him. We have four uh, baptisms today that that we're celebrating that they came to him, and we're going to have a uh, a visual, uh, prophetic, uh, outwardly uh, showing of what happened on the inside where they were buried with Christ, and they are risen to walk a new life. And so I just can't wait. We have four of them, and I cannot wait. Because what happened on the inside, listen, they completely, God completely saved them, those that came to him, because they came to him, and they came through God, through Jesus, because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus is praying for us right now. He's always interceding for us. He's doing it right now. Listen, if Jesus is praying for us and each other and and all of us, shouldn't we be praying for each other? Shouldn't we be praying for one another? Listen, there are some biblical examples, and there are so many. I can't even mention all of them right now. But here's the last one I want to give you. Here's number six to give you, uh, and that is this. Prayer is our responsibility. It is the responsibility of the church to pray for lost people. There's a story of uh, Aaron (coughs) Aaron and Moses uh, back in the the Old Testament in the the book of Numbers. And Aaron and I, talk about ministry, dude. Moses at some point was just like, God, just either kill me or kill them. I can't take it anymore. Kind of like the Jerry Clower story, you know, where he gets up in a bear, start a fight with somebody, and uh, somebody shows up with a gun, and he's like, what do I do? He said, just shoot up in here amongst us. One of us has got to have some relief, you know. Just, I don't care if it's me or him, but somebody has to die. But they, Aaron and, I mean, they were struggling, man. They were struggling. Uh, the people were complaining and whining about Aaron and Moses' leadership, and God was like, all right, that's it. I can't take it anymore. And he was like, I'm about to send a plague, and it's over. I'm about to start wiping some people out. He was done with the Israelites. And so here's what happens. And so the Bible says, so Aaron, because God was so frustrated with what was going on, so Aaron did as Moses said, and he ran to the midst of the assembly because Moses told him to go do it. And the plague had already started, so God was sending a plague. It had already gotten started. Among the people, but Aaron offered the incense and made the atonement for them. So here Aaron goes and stands between what God was wanting to do and the people. And and watch what happens. Here's what it says about what Aaron did. I love this. It says, he stood in between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. But if you read it, you'll find out that 14,700 Marty died. But Aaron and Moses loved the people that were whining about them, because that's what ministry is, that he went and stood between the living and the dead, and the plague stopped. Aaron went and made an atonement. He went and had some incense, and he made an atonement to stop God's hand from killing all of them. God God expects us. Now, isn't that crazy that God said, I'm just going to wipe them out? And Aaron said, hold up, God. We don't want you. We love them too much. Please don't kill them all. I'm pretty sure maybe they they allowed a few of them to die before they started doing the atonement. I'm not sure. (laughs) There's probably a few like, God, if you'll start with them, maybe we'll just let you go for a minute, then I'll go ahead and do the atonement. I, I'm, maybe not. I'm just thinking. It's just it's what goes through my head when I read stories like this. Did they get to pick the 14,700 or was it just random? But he stood between the living and the dead. You know what we're doing right now? We're standing between the living and the dead. The hell has been called the abode of the dead. We're in the land of the living right now. And we are standing between the dead and the living. And we are saying, God, please don't give up on my brother. Please don't give up on my parents. They're going to spend eternity somewhere, and I want to see them in heaven. It's expected of us to pray. But it's the thing that we do the least as as Christians. And and if you're just honest, it's the thing that we do the least. We travel the country teaching on this material. And I'm going to tell you right now, uh, we've been in some prayer meetings where there was three, four, two people. 
And we've been in prayer meetings where there was 100, but the church ran 5,000. Because it's one of the things that we don't do. It's the most powerful thing you can do is to pray for somebody. I'm going to tell you, give you some really cool stuff in the next couple of weeks. Don't miss it. I'm going to give you one more verse because this is going to one more verse to show you uh, that we are expected to do this. First Peter 2.25 says, you are being built to a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. Do you know what God expects of a priest? To stand between the living and the dead. He's expecting you and I to do it. There may be somebody in hell right now because you didn't pray. I'm going to say that one more time. There may be somebody in hell right now because you didn't pray. S.D. Gordon, a powerful man of God, he has this quote I want to share with you to close it out. It says, I cannot resist the conviction that there are people in that lower lost world, talking about hell, who are there because someone failed to put his life in touch with God and pray. I cannot resist the conviction that there are some people in hell today because I haven't stopped what I'm doing and gotten off of social media and turned the computer off and turned off the TV and stayed away from the sports for a few days and just got in front of my face in front of God and said, God, please save my brother. So I can't resist the conviction that there are people in hell today because I didn't pray. I don't think we're going to be able to see into hell whenever we get to heaven. I don't think that that exists, but maybe it does, but... I think we'd be heartbroken to see all the people that were there that we crossed paths with and we were too busy to stop and talk to. Am I telling you to go hit them over the head with a Bible when you leave here, when you go to Walmart? No. Start a relationship with them. Pray for them. I'm challenging you this morning. Maybe you've done that recently. Maybe you found Jesus recently. You haven't been water baptized. Uh, we have some extra clothes. We're about to do water baptism. Just jump in. Well, let us know first. Don't just. <laughs> we'll be out there momentarily, okay? But maybe that's your next, maybe your next step. You've already found Jesus, and you just need that. Maybe you haven't found Jesus. You need to do that today. Maybe you're here, and you're just like, man, I just, church just gives me the heebie-jeebies. Uh, you probably went to the wrong one. Because where he is, there's life. And we want to be a life-giving church. We want to be a life-giving church. So maybe you're here today, and you just haven't connected. We're going to ask you to get into a life group. Go through growth track. That's next. Step one's today. Great time to do it. Maybe it's salvation. You need to surrender your life today. Maybe you've done that. You need to get water baptized. Whatever your next step is, I want to challenge you. Listen, you will not fulfill the Great Commission until you're taking next steps. And I don't want to be this. this is, I, don't, I do not want to have this conviction on me that there are people who are in that lost lower place because I didn't pray for them. I know that's heavy this morning, but we should feel some weight. Ministry is not light. It should be heavy. And we need to pray. And don't stop Pray. We're going to give you some really powerful tools coming up in the next couple of weeks. Don't, I'm telling you, don't miss a single week. We want to give you a copy of this book. When you go to Next Steps, we'll give you a copy, um, maybe even two if we have enough. But don't, I'm telling you right now, don't just take it. Read it. Let it change the way you live, the way you pray, the way you act, the way you witness, and let God use you like he wants to.